Hey everybody, it's Ben. I had a fascinating game today. Game 14 of the World Championship match. Uh, the score before this game was tied. So the winner of the game uh, is the World Champion. And if the game is drawn, then they have playoffs tomorrow. So let, let's see what happened. Uh, Ding was white. Go Ding. And uh, they played another Nimzo Indian. Okay. I wonder why the sound isn't working for the moon. That doesn't matter, but. Uh, I checked the sound. Let's see. Yeah, sounds good. I blame chess.com. Okay. And. He played e3 again, and uh, castles. Now, uh, in in the other game where they played the Nimzo Indian, which Ding ended up winning uh, very suspiciously, White played a3, and he ended up taking with the pawn and playing rook a2 later and sliding his rook over, and the game was totally nuts. And eventually Jan was winning and then there was a draw and then Jan blundered and lost and so forth. Uh, okay, so today uh, a new move was played on move five for the match, which is typical. I don't think they had the same position after move 10 in any two games. That's the one thing I'll remember about this match was all the openings were different. Played bishop to d2, which is a move I'm not familiar with. Um, but I was watching the live commentary. So it's, you know, sort of meek. Um, but it's not in jail. So that's the difference. It's, it's not a run-of-the-mill move. Yeah, you don't get it. Okay, so he played d5. That's fine. Uh, a3. Now, obviously the point of bishop d2 is that when they take, you'll take with the bishop and not double your pawns and have the two bishops without having a doubling of the pawns. And there's nothing wrong with that move. But he decided to go back. So black has sort of a queen's gambit kind of structure uh, where he's down a tempo because he played bishop b4 and bishop e7 instead of just making these five moves. And the advantage is this move doesn't do very much for the extra tempo, and the bishop is blocked by this pawn. It's not on g5, which you would see in a queen's gambit. So like if this was the position, this would just be a normal queen's gambit declined. So, so, so this is fine. Okay, and white played knight f3. And black has a choice of moves here. He can play knight bd7, c5, b6, and they're all they're all fine. And he played c5, which is fine. Uh, dc, bishop takes c5. And so black has lost another tempo because he's played bishop e7, bishop, I'm sorry, bishop b4, bishop e7, bishop takes c5, when if white had taken this pawn, you know, with the bishop on f8, we just take. So this is a reversed queen's gambit accepted where white is up three tempi. So you could see this in a queen's gambit accepted, and that means black is playing it, so white has an extra tempo because he's white. And black has played bishop here, bishop here, bishop here. So black has wasted two tempi. And so to show you what I mean, because you're probably all really confused. So like this is a queen's gambit accepted. Okay. Right, so here it's white's move, 
because it's White's move, and there's a known theoretical position. If we gave black the moves a6, bishop d7, and made it black's move, that's three extra tempi because it's white's move here, that would be the game in colors reversed. So this position's slightly better for white, but if black plays here and here and makes another move, probably it's slightly better for black. Okay, and that's what we have here. Just it's with colors reversed. It's hard for you guys to understand that because, you know, you're you. You know what can I tell you? Okay. So the tempi you're up is you get to make a move instead of your opponent making a move, and you played these passive moves. So that's why it's not like a winning position. Or anything. Okay. So white played queen c2. This lines up the queen with the bishop. Um, so sometimes you can take and move your knight and the bishop's attacked. And sometimes you can play bishop d3 and put pressure on this pawn. And sometimes you can play rook d1 and pin the d-pawn to the queen. So black avoided all that and just played d takes c4. And Fabi wasn't a fan of that. Fabi thought black should just play knight c6. But okay, d takes c4 is fine. Bishop takes c4. Um, so white hopes to have an advantage because they have a symmetrical pawn structure, but white's played these four moves and black has played these two moves. So white hopes to have an advantage. I'm sorry, five moves. So white's played these five moves. Those pieces have all moved from where they were and black's played these two moves. So white's up three tempi but still about equal. Okay, knight bd7 makes a lot of sense because you defend your bishop, you defend your knight, you block the d file attacking your queen, and if you play b6, bishop b7, your knight on c6 isn't blocking your bishop. So that's really good move, knight bd7. Rook to d1, which is a little strange <clears throat> because if white castles soon, Rook on f1 doesn't really have a good place to go. Okay, now, this is the first move that I find strange. And then the next 10 moves, I find a lot of moves strange. Can you explain why having three extra tempi does not give you a huge advantage? I did. Thanks, DS Panda, for subscribing with Prime. Okay, so... Uh, in this position, it makes sense for Black to get his bishop out because his bishop sucks. So the most obvious move is b6. White makes some move, and, and then we play bishop to b7. And um, it's not clear why Jan didn't do that because I haven't spoken to Jan, so I don't know why he didn't do that. Okay. What he did is okay. He played bishop e7. This gives the square for the knight to go to c5 later. It's a little passive. So black's played bishop b4, bishop e7, bishop c5, bishop e7. So, you know, white's better. Now, if you want to punish your opponent for making four bishop moves in the opening, you don't like castle and play h3 and play queen b1 and play bishop a2. You have to punish them. If you just do nothing, black will play b6 and bishop b7 and rook c8 and normal position. Right. Yeah, queenside castling is terrible. Fabi also suggested that, but that's ridiculous. Okay. So in this position, White should definitely play the move e4, which is what Fabi expected. And uh, it's not clear why he didn't play it. It's possible he liked what he did better. And you're threatening e5, which gives you a big advantage. Um, so queen c7 is forced. Otherwise, e5 is, is really strong. And that attacks the bishop. And now, if white wants to get an advantage, he has to play forcefully. He can't always retreat. 
He has to play knight b5, which defends his bishop and attacks the queen. And now black has two moves that make sense, queen b8 and queen c6. And it's not clear which move is better, and it depends how long you let the engine sit. It goes back and forth between which move is better. And it says that white has a slight advantage. So the problem with queen c6 is I can play e5. You didn't stop e5. And Fabi and Hess were looking at queen e4 check. I think that was Fabi suggesting that. And this is a really bad position for, for black. This is terrible. This bishop's terrible. My knight has good squares. I have more space. This... Uh, this isn't this is this is bad this is bad for black. If it's white's move, knight c7 wins immediately, then rook b8, bishop takes a7. Um so this is this is not good for black. This is bad. So after after uh e5, black would play knight to d5. And the engine says white is slightly better. Uh white can play queen d3 or knight to d4. And, you know, black has a problem with his bishop, which also gives him a problem with his rook. Because, all right. So black could also try queen b8 with the idea of stopping e5, which makes sense. And, you know, the engine thinks that white is a little better here. White has a lead in development. White has a pawn on e4, more space. And, you know, black has to still get his pieces out. So that's what white should have done. And instead, Ding played knight g5. I wouldn't give that a question mark. It's not, it's not the best move. And he wants to play for a direct attack. Um, against the black king. So black played h6. And knight here doesn't make any sense unless you play h4. Otherwise, why, why'd you go here? Okay. And so white wants to play like knight e4, bishop c3, and give checkmate somehow. Okay, and the engine doesn't like this for white. Uh, Ding seemed pretty happy. Ding was like knight g5, h4, bitch. Um, I assume that's what he said. He said it in Mandarin, but I assume it was bitch. Uh, okay. And then Nepo heard him and said, suka. Sukeblat. No, he didn't say that. Don't ban me from YouTube. I'm just kidding. Okay, so uh, Black played the best move. Obviously, if you take, <clears throat> you're opening up a can of worms, because you know I got I got the H file and knights attacked and so forth. This is simply winning for White. The engine says Black resigns. So that's that's silly to open the H file for White. So he played Queen C7. That's the best move. That attacks the bishop on c c4, and if the bishop moves to a non-defending of the queen square, then the knight is pinned, which is actually what happened. And um, another another slight mistake from Ding. Ding actually needs to play bishop here or bishop here, so his queen's defended by his bishop, and then his knight's not pinned. Uh, but he didn't do that. He played bishop e2 which shows that something's wrong with white's play. And now is a good time for black to play b6, bishop, b7, and just have a better position because white's king is going to have a hard time castling with this pawn on h4. Um, and if we never take this and the file never gets open, it's not clear what white's doing here. But Jan played a safer way. It's good to be safe when you're playing the final game of the world championship and you have black. So he played rook to d8. He wants to play knight f8. And if he plays knight f8, which he did, then, then you can safely take on g5 because your knight on f8 is stopping mate. So rook d8 is fine. Okay. And he played rook to c1 because his queen's not defended. So now he can move his knight. For example... If it was White's move, White could try knight d5, which I think loses, but he could try it. And the idea behind knight d5, actually it doesn't lose, is if you play knight takes knight, I checkmate you, 
And if you play queen takes queen, I take this with check first. So it's good to have your queen defended. So I agree with rook c1. And he did play knight f8, which is fine. And in this position, black is seriously threatening the knight on g5. Because h7 is defended by this knight. So there's two logical moves. There's knight e4 and there's knight f3. And they're both fine. So he played one of them. Psychologically, it's very difficult to play knight f3 because he played knight f3 to g5. So if he plays knight g5 to f3, you feel stupid. Um, if you play knight e4, it's like, yeah, knight g5, knight e4. Look at that plan I had. Okay. And now, funnily enough, the engine thinks this move is interesting, knight e8. It's not a move a human would play, but the engine says it's okay. So he played knight takes. You could take either way on e4, and the engine says they're both equal. Um, he decided to take with the knight. I guess he decided I don't have an attack anymore. And if I castle, I've played h4, which is silly. So let's trade queens. Then it doesn't matter if I castle. Now, a lot of beginning players, which is all of you, <clears throat> learn things when you first learn chess. And then there's a lot of exceptions in chess, about half the time. And you guys don't know when the exceptions are important or how important the thing you learned is. So for example, if you were told in the opening, you should develop your pieces and play in the center, and you were also told giving your queen away for nothing is bad, and you don't equate which is more important. One isn't important, and one's really important. One of the things that's not important in chess that you learned was to castle. Okay, so usually you castle, and if you don't, then you don't. There's tons of games where you don't castle. Not you, but like good players. And when we trade queens on c2, which is a good idea, then there's no reason for white to castle. That doesn't even make any sense. The king is safe on e2. And if I castle, my h pawn's hanging. My king is defending my bishops and the, the, the d-file. But people watching the game live... And I, I think I know what getting a lobotomy is like. It's like reading the chat during the live game. Man, everybody's so dumb. That's why my rating is so high. I don't play any good moves, but you guys are really dumb. I mean, you just if you just read the chat, you see how dumb everybody is. It's amazing. Like, I think when you're born and you're a baby and you don't know anything, I think some of those kids are smarter than the people in the chat. I think... Knowing nothing is more intelligent than knowing all the wrong stuff. You know, like somebody who's a MAGA or something. So I feel better about myself because, you know, people are so stupid. So it makes me feel less stupid. And that's why even though all of my moves are ridiculous, I don't see anything anymore. And I get in time trouble. and I'm Horrible. I'm still 2,700 because you guys hooked me up. Imagine if the only things that played chess were engines, and then I played chess. I'd feel really dumb. I'd get zero out of a thousand. Damn. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it, by the way. Thank you. Okay. So, if White could safely castle, it's not clear that he would. But people on the, watching the game live are like, White didn't castle. This is a world championship match. There's already been two or three games where somebody didn't castle. But, okay. So he played bishop d7 because his bishop has sucked for long enough. Bishop b4, that's not a move I would ever consider. Okay, I don't think it's a good move. I think everything is completely equal. And after bishop b4, I'd rather have black. Um, I think this is just a poor move. Sometimes you play bad moves. Okay, so he traded, and he played bishop c6, which is fine. 
And now White did something I would never do. I wouldn't even consider it. And he did it very confidently. Uh, Bishop f3 is the best move, and then black's better because white has these double isolated pawns for no reason. Uh, but he played knight c5. And I almost think, I don't think this, but I almost think it, that he didn't see bishop takes g2. But that would be like blasphemous to say that he doesn't see you know one move ahead. But it's such a strange move, knight c5. Okay, so he took the pawn to g1 and in this position probably black should play bishop c6 uh he played bishop d5 which is okay he wanted to force the pawn to e4 so his rook would have the d4 square which i understand and then the knight has these dark squares also so that's understandable okay bishop c6 b5 and the idea is if the bishop moves i take my pawn back and so on and so forth. Uh, and that's what happened. Bishop e8 is good. Knight takes and rook to d4. So black has four to three on the king's side and white has this isolated weak pawn and this pawn is attacked. And white has two to one, but it's a doubled pawn and these pawns can get attacked also. So black is obviously better frankly. Oh, somebody must have done something. Let me see what they did. It says a hype train is close. Oh, Poingalis gave 100 bits. And Farty Party subscribed at tier one. Yay, go Farty Party. Okay. So, White played Rook C4, defending his pawn. And White wants to trade everything. So the game ends in a draw. Black correctly played rook to d7, attacking the knight. And knight has to go either here or here. Now, the strangest thing that happened in the match happened here. Um, the strangest non-chess thing. Ding picked up his knight and put his knight on c5. And with his hand still on it, put it back at b7 and started thinking again. That's something that amateur players do. So very rare for a grandmaster to do that, to not be sure about their move as they're making it. Amateurs, that's every move. They touch their piece, then they sit there, and you know, and in their head it's going to do 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 do. There's nothing. There's nothing there, right? It's it's just tabula rasa time. Thanks, farty party. Right, amateurs, you know, do all kinds of crazy stuff. But world champions usually don't, you know, play here and then put it back and then start thinking. Okay, so he played knight c5 eventually. No harm, no foul. Thanks trying to learn. Go hype train. Yeah. Okay, and then rook, rook c7. And uh, Fabi and Hess were hoping that black played rook d6. And the reason is black played bishop c b4, bishop e7, bishop c5, bishop e7, bishop b4. That's what black's bishop did this game. And if he played rook d6, then he would have played rook d8, rook d4, rook d5, rook d7, rook d6. I mean, you got to you got to like that. And the engine says rook d6 is excellent. Rook c7 is also excellent. And either move, we have to move your rook, either move attacks this pawn. So it's unclear which move is better, but rook c7 looks better. It looks like it's more aggressive. Okay, then white immediately played rook c3, which defends the pawn and defends the rook. Perfect. Now, black has a choice here. He can play the move he played, or he can play knight g6, attacking the pawn and trying to get the knight to some good square. But he played the move he played, doubling rooks. And in this position, white has one move, thanks Poingalis, that's better than the other moves, but it's not a human move. It's a very computer move. 
not only would a human not play this, they probably wouldn't consider it. If you watch the live broadcast, you know what it is. If you remember, which you don't. And that move is knight b7. That's the engine move. And the idea is if you take it, you lose your rook, so you can't take it. Okay. And then if you win a pawn, because winning a pawn is good, that's what I would do, then white plays king d2 attacking the rook, then the rook's coming to a1. This pawn's hard to defend. And then after rook c7, knight d6, it looks really bad for white. Like this, you know, is lined up here. But the engine says, no, rook here, e5. And knight g6 looks good. It attacks the pawn. If you play f4, I can take the pawn. And the engine says, no, I just play king e3, and I'm attacking your bishop, and your bishop's trapped. So you play king f8. And now it looks like knight takes e5 is a threat, and knight takes h4 is a threat. And the engine says, I don't care. F4 is equal and H5 is equal because this is so stupid. I have the best knight ever and you have these stupid pieces. Now, if I was playing and I saw that, I would never do this with white because I'm down a pawn or two. My E pawn is hanging and I don't see the compensation. And the engine says, no problem. So what do I know? Engine says f4 is equal, and it says h5 is equal. All right. So knight b7 is equal if two engines are playing. Thanks, Poingalis, your final bits. But okay, nobody's going to play knight b7. Even if they see that line, they're not going to think it's equal because black's up a pawn or two. So he played the move b4, and black decided to win a pawn with knight d7. Now... White should sacrifice a pawn and play king to d2. They take, and then he could play rook c1, for example. And white's down a pawn. He could take first or not. If you take this, my king can come in, and it's not clear who's better there. It's probably a draw. And then you, should, you could play check. And this should be a draw because black can't create a pass pawn on the king's side. And this pawn is weak. Black's going to have to protect it a lot. And white's king is better than black's. And white's bishop is better than black's bishop. Black's bishop is really passive. So the engine says this should be a draw. Um, it doesn't even say black's better. But obviously you would take black. Black's up a pawn. Anyway, that's the engine line is give up a pawn and get a draw in endgame. And Ding played rook g3, which is bad for two reasons. And here it seemed that, that Jan was impatient. Um, if you're patient, you just play g6 and you're like, what are you going to do? And the answer is, I don't know. That's the answer. Uh, black has a big advantage here. And as the game went, black also had an advantage, just not as much, but, but an advantage. So g6, slow but surely, but he played knight c5. I'm not saying I wouldn't. And it's equal material now, but white's king is very suspicious. This pawn's very suspicious. These, pawn, these pawns are all weak, and your king can get in trouble. Okay, he played bishop d3, which is okay. Doesn't lose. Rook to d8, and now white made a move that I would call the losing move. <clears throat> um, what white should do, which is very strange, is white should pin his own bishop. And the reason is it stops the move rook c3. I mean, you can play rook c3, but then dings the world champion after he takes it. And the idea is if you take this quote-unquote free pawn... Then I take this, you take, I take, and we get this ending that is very likely drawn. It's so drawn, the engine says black has almost no advantage. Okay, and we saw a similar endgame to this in the game because Jan messed up. Okay, 
So he played King Itsu, which is a terrible move. And I, I guess he un misunderstood Rook C3. He misunderstood it. R Rook C3 is really good for black. Um, you can't play Bishop B1 because Bishop takes B5 check wins immediately. And you have to, your Bishop's attacked. So now, now white, white's losing. And he played Rook check and Rook G3, which is forced. And now Jan made a mistake. Jan should play Rook B3. This puts pressure on the pawn. The Rook can come here check. And it's white's turn to move. It's not clear what he should do. There's not really an obvious move to make. So I don't know what white should do here. White's in trouble here. It's just a very bad ending for white because this bishop is under pressure, this pawn's under pressure, the king's under pressure, and black has no problem at all. Black's just doing great. And this, I would say, is a winning end game, but you could argue white has good drawing chances. Probably white has good drawing chances, but should I think should be winning. And Jan made a mistake here. <clears throat> he played e5. This loses a critical tempo. <clears throat> the idea behind e5 is it seems as though white's counterplay is to play rook h8 and take on h6. And it doesn't seem like white can do anything else. So when he plays e5, he says, if you play rook h8, I'll play rook d6, defending my pawn and unpinning my bishop. And he missed a key resource that White has. And I don't blame him. It's a brilliant resource. It's it's great. It's the it's one of the best things of the match. Is what happens soon. Now, some of you are probably wondering, why doesn't he just take this? Rook takes, Bishop takes, winning, and that is winning. Okay, but White made a mistake in that line. White doesn't take the rook. White plays rook takes e8 check and then takes the rook, and this is dead drawn. And if you do it the other way, rook takes, it's the same thing. But now, after rook takes, you can't play bishop takes because rook takes defends the rook, and now white's winning. So it's easy to blunder. So what he wants to do, if he could cheat, is play rook d6, bishop d7, and then play rook takes. And then he's winning because he'll play his bishop takes b5 move. Okay, so he played e5. This is a mistake. Rook h8. And now Jan realized what he had done because Jan thought a long time here. If Jan didn't realize what he had done, he would have played rook d6 immediately. The, the point of e5. Now, the problem is if black plays rook b3, like in the previous variation where I said black should play rook b3. Now, white has already played here because black already played there. Because white already played here, white can now play rook g8, which white couldn't do if his other rook was on g8 because you can't have both of your rooks on g8. And now if you take this, then white has an advantage in the end game, but it should be a draw. But no reason that white's worse here, obviously. And uh, if you take with this rook, again, there's there's no reason why white's worse here. White's slightly better, at least. And then this is like the eternal pin. And then white can play bishop c4 next move, and so forth. Okay, so Jan did play rook d6, and the idea is... If you double up on the bubble up, bishop d7, and black is completely winning. That extra tempo is important. Now the bishop's attacked. Bishop b1 loses to bishop b5, and rook g3 defending the bishop loses to rook takes. And then bishop b5. So we don't, we don't have time for rook g8. Now it turns out white can chill and play rook e3 and probably draw. 
The engine says black is better, but not winning better, just better. But white played more um, assertively and a move that would be like in a problem. And, it, and Fabi noticed it a couple of moves ago. And that move is B6. And this is what we call a clearance sacrifice. It clears the B5 square. So what white wants to do, assuming it's white's move, I'm going to make it white's move, is play rook takes check, bishop B5 check, and rook takes rook. And luckily, black is still drawing here with the move rook C6. But that's what he wants to do. And I also want to play pawn takes pawn or B7 and win. So, so he played rook takes. And then we go bishop, rook takes, bishop check. Bishop B5 check. And this rook and pawn inning is a draw. And the engine says it's a dead draw, but... The game's not even half over. Now we have another chess game where Black's trying to win a pawn up end game. Thanks, Kaka W44, for the sub. Okay, so he plays King D7, stopping White's Rook from getting active. Rook F3, attacking the F pawn. King E7. Rook C3, he wants to play Rook C6, attacking this, and Rook A6, and so forth. A5. Rook c7 check, rook c6 check, and rook a6. And during the live commentary, Hess and Fabi were like, well, this is just a draw. Like, black can't do anything. But that's not so true. It is a draw. So check, rook a2. So what black wants to do is eventually... Play rook a1, pawn a2. The black king has to either be on f3 or g2. The king's on g2. Black's king wants to run around here and eventually attack this pawn. Or if white plays f3, get his king in here. And white could keep his king on f3, but he has to make sure black can't just take this pawn. So it's sort of tricky how to draw this. So Ding was using up tons of time. And the easiest way to draw, it turns out, is to play h5 right away. And the problem with playing h5 is if I do play this winning attempt, then I can go take your h-pawn once my pawn's on a2. But if his pawn's on h4, <clears throat> even if black gets his king here, he, he, if white plays f3, he, he can't get your king over there. If he plays h5, then you can go take it. So he decided to keep his pawns close together, which is also drawn, and he just played king g3. Okay, and h5 was played, keeping the pawn on h4. Rook a8, rook a1. And it looks like the way black can try to win is to play a2, then play rook e1, rook takes a2, rook takes e4, and try to win that three versus two since white has disconnected pawns. That ending is a draw, but that seems like the best black can do. And he didn't do that. He tried to win another way, a way that I didn't look at. And he played the move uh, rook a2. And the way he wants to win, which is what he did, is move his king over, giving this pawn away, and then play rook b2 a2 and have the rook on the side of the pawn instead of in front of it. The rook is much better on the side. With the rook in front of it, I, I can't do anything. With the rook on the side, my king can come in and, and win. If my rook is here and my pawn's here, black plays king b1 and wins or king b3 and wins. If the rook is here and the pawn is here, I don't care where your king goes. I just check him away. So that's a better winning attempt. I like what Jan did. Okay, so he moved around a little bit, hanging around, and then he played his winning plan. And he didn't play the move eight. He didn't play the move a two. 
Rook B3 check is a better winning attempt because then I play King somewhere and then I play F4 and we both have passed pawns. So black, black's not better here at all. So he played correctly, played Rook B3 check, forcing the King back. And in this position, white only has one move that draws. Black's winning plan is simple. King here attacking the rook. The rook has to stay behind the pawn. And then my king walks up and I win. White needs counterplay. So he played the only counterplay move, f4. There is no other move that draws. Yeah, but plus two is just a draw. Okay, so f4. E takes f4, e5. And he's like, you got a pass pawn, I got a pass pawn, and if we trade them, that's a drawn rook and pawn ending. I'm not sure if he actually said that, but he was thinking it. Okay, king b7, the rook stays behind the pawn, king c6, rook check. Now, what black wants to do is force white to play e6, play king e7, king f6, rook e3, and try to win this end game. White wants black to move his king up, so I push my pawn, and when your rook takes it, I take this pawn and it's a draw. So it's a cat and mouse game. King b5, rook a7, he wants to push his pawn. Now, if you play king b4, then I could immediately draw by checking and taking the rook. And even though black is a pawn up and it's black's turn, this is a dead draw. There's no way to win. This king's over here. If we trade queens, white's better. White goes here, 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 here. Yeah, king's no good. So this is a dead draw. So you can't play king before, and I'm going to start pushing my pawn and you're going to take my pawn, and I'll take your pawn. That's a dead draw. <clears throat> Thank you, Poingalis. So he played king back to b6, and he's like, whatever. I'm going to push my pawn, and then I'm going to take your pawn. So he says, okay, I'm going to stop your pawn. And we've had this position already. Always repeat. And he wanted black to play here so he could play e6, e7, e8, and take this pawn. Okay, but black didn't want to do that. So black played king d7. Now, what black, what, what black wants, black wants white to play e6, which does draw, but now white has, black has a winning plan. Black plays rook here, king here, king here, and tries to win this endgame. And white doesn't want to allow that. So white just chills. Plays king f2, king g2, king f2, king g2, king f2, king g2. And says, your, your king can't move up. Going here doesn't do anything. And if you go over here, I'm going to you know do that again. So they moved around a lot. If you take this pawn, I take this pawn. That's pretty drawn. You can play king f1 or king e2. They both draw. He's like, your king's not moving up. <clears throat> your king already went over there. Then you went back here. So what are you going to do? <clears throat> so nothing's happening. And eventually he tries to come back here. But now I can play e6. and you Now you don't have to play e6. And you can't play king e7. If you could play king e7, he wouldn't have played e6. And the idea is if the king goes here, my rook goes back, and then I'm going to try to queen my pawn and take this pawn. And if you play king d8, now if it was black's turn, he could play king e7 and have some winning chances. It's a draw, but black's better. Rook a7, and we stop king e7. And now, once again... White plays king g2, king f2, king g2, king f2. And black's only hope, which doesn't work, 
is to win both of these pawns for this pawn. That ending is a draw. And he can't do it. <laughs> if he could do it, he would, you know, try, but he can't do it. So he played King Yin. He's, he's trying. Rook takes e6. And now white can still blunder. King f3. Rook checks, skewering the king and rook. But he played king f2. And he's like, yay, I'm going to be two pawns up. But look where his king is. Okay, and now everything draws. Every legal move draws except king f3, which falls into the a4 mentioned skewer. Played rook f5, threatening the pawn. You have to take king f3. You can't move your rook. If you move your rook vertical, I take this. If you move your rook horizontal, I take this. So he moves his king up. And even if black could move his king up again, he can't do anything. I can just draw by doing nothing here. This is the worst place for the rook. You, 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 you can't move your rook. So I can just play rook here, rook here, and draw. But he decided to take the pawn. Also good. And they agreed to a draw here. So very well defended endgame by Ding. And the surprise ending is it was a draw. That was the longest game of the match in terms of time. It was a seven-hour game. And in terms of moves, it was a 90-move game. And Ding was defending for 90% of it. And he defended pretty well. I think <clears throat> after Black didn't play Rook B3, which may have won, maybe, uh, and he played instead E5, I don't think White made any mistakes after that. So I think he defended really, really, really well for 54 moves. After this, they played 54 moves. I don't think Ding made one mistake. Every move Ding made was perfect. And even though they made mistakes earlier in the game, where like white was better and then black was better, that maybe black was winning, because the, the, the level of play was so high in the end game after, after he played E5, uh, it was 97.1, 97.2, the cap score. And if the game had ended, you know, if like, Black had played Rook here and White had made a mistake. The cap score for White would have been, you know, in the 80s. But playing 54 excellent moves in a row after E5, your cap score goes up. I don't think he did anything wrong the rest of the game. And he needed that to draw because he's suffering. And that's great defense. It's hard to beat 27, 2800 players because they defend really well. And even though Black may have been winning for a move or two and White was better for a move or two, I think it draws a fair result because Ding defended for like four hours in a tough position. And there were a lot of tricks to avoid and he avoided them. And he played F4, which is the only move that drew. That drew. Thanks, Stuckfish. 100 bits. Yeah, I saw Fabi saying never play F3, F6, yeah. All the top players in the world know that never play F3, F6 is me. They all know that and they laugh. Then when it happens, they laugh more. The worst move, one of the worst moves Fabi's ever made in his life. Arguably the worst move was he was playing a Kobe in, in the last round of the U.S. championship about six years ago. I have no idea what year it was. I'm going to say six years ago. It could have been 10 years ago. It could have been three years ago. I'll just say six. And Fabi was winning with black, two connected pass pawns in an endgame, and he played F6 losing. And he lost to a Kobian from a winning endgame. Never play F6. F6 is one of Fabi's worst moves ever with black. Terrible. Anyway, you can find the game because a Kobian never beats Fabi. So as soon as you find a game, a Kobian beat Fabi, that's, that's the game. Nine years ago? Nine. I remember it like it was yesterday, except for one thing. Anyway, that was a long recap because it was a really long game. The game lasted more than seven times longer than my recap. Dr. Janitor was here subscribed. Hooray. And so forth. 
Anyway, I hope you liked my recaps. I guess tomorrow at 5 a.m. Eastern, I think they're playing four rapid games. Unless it's two and a half, half or three zero, then they'll play three. And I could be wrong about that. That's just what I think. Thinking's not my strong suit. So I think they're going to play four rapid games tomorrow. I'm not sure what the time control is. 25-10, I don't know, 25-5, 15-10, I don't know. I have no idea what the... But anyway, this is the fourth match in 10 years that ended in a tie. A non-Gelfand... Actually, a non-Gelfand was 11 years ago, so I apologize. A non-Gelfand was 6-6, six, six, and they went to Rapid, which Anand won. Carlson... Karyakin was 6'6". Six, six. They went to Rapid, which Magnus won. Carlson Caruana was 6'6", six, six, and they went to Rapid. And now we have 7'7", seven, seven, and they go to Rapid. So the people who are challenging each other for the world championship are pretty evenly matched. In most of the matches, it's tied at the end. Most of the matches. More than half. Rawr. And then uh, Magnus won three matches against Anand, Anand, and Nepo without going to tie breaks. So the last seven world championship matches, four of them ended in a tie, and they're deciding who the classical champion is with Rapid, which doesn't make any sense. But that's what happened. F6 is like the worst move Fabi ever played, Tonkan. That's such a bad move. God damn. So that was that was a really exciting classical match. Lots of decisive games. Um, Ding won when he had to, when he was down a point. And Ding looked like he was going to lose this game, and he defended like a machine. The last 54 moves of this game, Ding made, did nothing wrong. And he was under a lot of pressure. This position is terrible for White. But if you defend perfectly, you draw... So the engine just says equal. So that confuses the onlooker because you don't really know what's going on. What's going on is white has to play perfectly every move that he can draw. Black can do whatever he wants and draw. Black can make all kinds of blunders and draw. White got to play better than perfect to draw, and he did. And in more than one occasion, he played the only move that drew. I mean, he played B6, which was amazing, and F4 was amazing. I mean, those were just great moves. And so forth. Anyway, great game. I'll see you guys in six hours when I do my sub Saturday. Thanks for watching and enjoying, you know, all that stuff. So forth. And let's see, who do I raid? It looks like Hikaru. All right, I'll see you guys later. Thanks, thanks for donating. Bye, everybody.